We are live. Welcome everybody to PTP LinkedIn Live Lunch and Learn. Today we're talking about streamlining genomics with AWS. And our guest today is Andrew Hesse from PTP. Andrew, thanks for joining me. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be here, John. Okay, Andrew, before we kick off this show, I think we need to start with a joke. Are you ready for it? <laughs> I'm ready. I love a joke. Okay, by the way, please excuse the corny dad jokes. But all right, let's kick this off. Andrew, I wouldn't worry about your smartphone or your TV spying on you. You want to know why? Why is that? Your vacuum cleaner has been gathering dirt on you for years. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> okay. All right. Excuse the dad jokes, but we got to kick it off and have a little bit of fun. Andrew, today we're talking about streamlining genomics with AWS. And, I, you know, I want to kick off a couple of the questions with it is, Andrew, how does cloud computing help to make sure that you have the scalability needed to handle all the data generated for research? Sure. So, yeah, I mean, I really think that scale is uh, is rather trivial when it comes to the cloud. Um, you know, to look at it, say it another way, is that uh, compute infrastructure resources are no longer a rate limiting factor when integrating your workflows into the cloud. Um, it's just, uh, you know, near, near real time that we can upscale and downscale. And I think that latter point of downscaling is also really important and overlooked aspect. Um, you know, most people, when we think of scaling, we think of increasing scale, but, uh, you know, a lot of genomics labs and especially in like diagnostic labs, they have different missions and objectives, but they're all interested in some aspect of research. So a lot of times they do collaborations with large university research institutes or medical centers. And um, with with that, you know, you may go for those those studies, maybe 10,000 patients or 30,000 patients that end up getting sequenced as part of that study. And so what happens when that's done, right? You need to now downscale. And, you know, it's obviously ideal if that's a simple few clicks in an environment and, you know, a little bit of rearrangement than if you just purchased you know, millions of dollars of data center infrastructure on site. Andrew, that's a really good point. When people look at it, they think of scalability of going uh, bigger, right? You need to yeah. handle that data. But then when you're done handling that data, what do you do with it? Do you leave it up? And having that automation to be scalable and downsize it is a huge cost savings benefit. Absolutely. And you're, I know you're a big FinOps guy, so that probably lands with you quite well. <laughs> it definitely does. Andrew, I want to jump over to my next question is, what are some of the biggest challenges that Genovics Labs face when they're integrating cloud computing into their workflows? For the challenges, in, in my experience, um, you know, working on the diagnostic side of things, uh, one of the biggest challenges I think is, is, is self-perceived or self-inflicted, if you will. Um, it's, it's a fear of the cloud. <laughs> I mean, I want to talk about corny jokes. I like to say, uh, you know, we'd be afraid to talk about the weather, um, at some of our labs. Cause if we said it's cloudy, I, we think it might come and swoop us off and, uh, take us <laughs> into a dark room somewhere. Do I ever say cloud? <laughs> so in these regulated spaces, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a fear that maybe the cloud, you know, because it's not on site, it's not as secure, um, that it's more exposed. And, and that's just not true as, you know, we know, especially in this day and age, uh, the cloud is, is just as secure or more secure. And, you know, a lot of what we do is to add layers of security to uh, customer environments and, and make them even more robust. So it's, um, you know, it's really, it's not, it's not a, it's not a, a real challenge. It's, it's one that's perceived and comes with, you know, fear regular regulated, uh, companies tend to move a bit slower <laughs> because, you know, they're regulated and they have to take a lot more into consideration. They can't be as, as dynamic. And, uh, that's resulted in some hesitation, but I've successfully implemented cloud in a number of companies I worked for when I was with them. And, you know, I look to work with those folks uh, from this side of the equation now. Andrew, you're saying like the fear of the unknown of cloud, the skill sets behind it, and obviously the security around cloud and making sure and understanding that cloud is pretty much more secure than their own environment and their own data center. Right. Yeah, definitely. 
Andrew, how do you actually overcome some of those challenges that are presented to them with the cloud, the unknowns and the security aspects of it? So, you know, in my in my case, as sort of an internal champion of cloud, when I was at the lab I was at, we were, you know, presenting all the data with IT and, and pushing. We were in a big institution, so, you know, a lot of uh, bureaucracy involved. But, um, you know, in the in, in this case, it's really just one of taking that leap because it's a self-perceived problem, like I noted before. And so, um, you know, if what you're currently doing is 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 not scalable and commercially viable, this is one way that you can you can add a a whole new element to how you, a variable to how you can control your costs and everything. And so going into the cloud is just something you should do and, you know, uh, look into use cases. I mean, so many people are in the cloud now that it's really starting to dissolve that myth, but, you know, it was there for a long time. Um, and, you know, there's, there's companies out there that can help with that. Andrew, how does cloud computing enable medicine to be more personalized? Yeah. So with... You know, if we look at the natural history of of genomics or any omics, really, so it can be proteomics and transcriptomics and all these fields, the chemistry was never the bottleneck, right? So, like the chemistry to do some some really high throughput stuff could have always been there, but the computational power to process all that data wasn't, or, um, you know, that's maybe the, the assay level, but then we can add in all this metadata we think of today with connecting that genomic information to EMR data and, and, and limbs data, laboratory information management systems, EMR is uh, electronic medical records. So patient history and all of this longitudinal information. Um, it's not that anybody wasn't thinking, you know, 30 years ago, like that sounds like a great idea. It's that it was it was sort of science fiction at the time. It was the future. Computing needed to be there to be able to make that happen, and and now it is. And the cloud makes that uh, you know uh, very possible for. It really kind of democratizes it, right? You don't need a billion dollars for a crazy data center like you can. Most companies can afford to get into some pretty serious compute hardware uh, via the cloud. When you're trying to understand the cloud and do all this massive com compute for the personalization, and I think it makes it a lot easier to separate the data, to duplicate it, to run parallel pipelines, to understand it. And then you have uh, specifics where you can pull out to personalize it for individuals. And it makes it easier to kind of really do your research and break it down while in the traditional sense, all your data was housed in terabytes of data to break it down. You needed to procure more hardware. You needed to have more people to kind of expand and go to it. I think cloud computing allows you to run a lot of things in parallel with cost savings in mind. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I, I think that there's, you know, across these different scientific disciplines that all have their own nuances, whether it be uh, genetics or or cell biology. At the infrastructure level, uh, we've seen uh, in the omics era, we've seen a convergence of of the problem and solution space. Right. So we can use the there's that scalability there just at like a economic or industry level where we can use a lot of the same tools to solve problems across the entire life sciences space uh, because the problem starts to become less differentiated there. So, um, you know, we need high compute power, whether we're doing massive in silico library screening of, of enzymes at a therapeutic company or whether we're doing whole genome sequencing on entire, entire population studies um, in genomics. Right. And those those are all relying on having the computational resources to, you could be sitting on uh, Nobel prize worthy scientific answers, but if you can't actually standardize and uh, analyze that data, then, you know, you know, it's, it's as good as not existing. Right. So, um, you know, the, the cloud really, again, makes that possible for both small and large institutions. Andrew, do you feel going back to our first question, the scalability of cloud has allowed everybody to enable this personalization because the data, which is masses amounts of data and having that on premise, you can actually duplicate that data much faster and scalable 
versus being limited to maybe your storage constraints. Do you feel that cloud has enabled this? Um, definitely, or at least for the 99% of, of, of organizations that wouldn't have the resources to, you know, just have a massive war chest to throw at it, of course. So, you know, the cloud is, has really made this, um, you know, again, going back to that level, that's, that's, that everything has been normalized to at the infrastructure level, it's, it creates a, a similar problem for everybody at that scale. And so this is now can answer, like it, it's made data science as important a part of biology or, or, or protein study as, as the actual biology or the proteins, you know, uh, science itself. Right. So yeah, it's definitely opened this up to, to everybody else because it's, it's, it's made it much more available and affordable and uh, accessible. Andrew, since this is only 15 minutes, I got one more question for you. How do you see the role of artificial intelligence? Yes, AI and machine learning evolving for genomics and diagnostics. This is a, a deep topic and a loaded one, but I'll do my best to, to give it uh, a high level here. Um, so when, a lot of times when we think about artificial intelligence, we're really thinking of like algorithms like uh, neural networks and, you know, uh, unsupervised learning and that that requires just massive amounts of high dimensional data to to work properly and we really don't see that type of volume of data available in in biomedical sciences but but we're able to use appropriate methods like so for example natural language processing works great right and it's pre-trained on there's a lot of pre-trained models so we can take those pre-trained models and uh, further train them on a given lexicon. So, you know, genetics and, and uh, therapeutic or in pharmacology to have these programs be able to scale the uh, consumption of scientific literature, right? And parse out and standardize that data. Once you parse out and standardize that data, now we have petabytes more data than we had before. So back to the original problem. It's like a, a, a positive feedback loop, right? Now we've generated more data that we can use to feed more advanced algorithms. And that can then feed more research questions that can then have the researchers using high throughput methods and high uh, throughput functional studies create the data to answer those questions. And, and that, that, that cyclic feed forward really just, uh, you know, will spiral uh, in a very positive way for the for for biomedical sciences in the industry, um, especially in genomics. Andrew, I hate to use the question evolve, but I think AI or artificial intelligence is helping and evolving the genomics and really playing a huge part in the diagnostics because it's going to be speed efficiency and we're just going to get better at it or at least put us on the right track for the answer that we're looking for. Definitely it just needs to be done right. And, um, and so it needs, it needs, it needs the care it deserves. It's, uh, it, there's, there's a reason you see it like in biology and like very discrete packets of functionality. And that is it being done right when you see that, you know, there, there's no, there's, there's no like chat GPT equivalent for like, you know, scientific research yet though. That's a bit away. Not yet. Um, <laughs> might, hold on a second. I got to write this down. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it, it ChatGPT had a lot more information to train on um, because it had all of the biomedical literature plus all of basically documented <laughs> human, uh, you know, documentation to, to, to work off of there, anything that's on the internet. So it's, it's, it's very robust, um, you know, it's for general use, but they're getting there. There's really creative ways people are using machine learning and AI in the space. And I've had the fortune of being able to work on some translational research projects with machine learning myself. Um, and yeah, it's a really exciting, really exciting time. Andrew, I got to wrap things up. So thank you for joining us for this PTP LinkedIn Live Lunch and Learn. And we're talking about streamlining genomics with AWS. Andrew, thank you for your time. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. All right, everybody, don't forget to stay tuned because we got more events coming up. So make sure you hit that like, subscribe, follow, whatever you can do on LinkedIn. 
for PTP. And until next time, because guess what? We're out of here. Thanks, Andrew.